Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at Apostles on this Father's Day week. And I hope all of you had a good week last week. And we come into God's presence to hear a familiar story today, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel. Uh, what an announcement to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, uh, next week is um, uh, June 28th, and Judy Valeri, one of our deacons, will be uh, bringing us God's word through her preaching and also presiding over worship next week. And then on July 5th, our new interim pastor, Steve Kaufman, it will be his first Sunday here as well. Uh, so today is my final Sunday with all of you, and I just thank you for the opportunity to be your pastor. And uh, we enter into God's presence this morning with a confession and forgiveness. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Martin Luther wrote in the small catechism, Confession embraces two parts. One is that we confess our sins. The other is that we receive absolution or forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself. And in no wise doubt, but firmly believe that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. We pause in our worship this moment for a silent confession and reflection in God's presence this morning. Gracious God, we are a sinful people. Our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep, deep to avoid. Forgive us for what we struggle to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become a burden in our relationship with you, our loved ones, and our world. Set us free from a past we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Your confession is pleasing to God and reflects your devotion to the one who created, loves, and sustains you each day. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, live now with a new beginning and renewed joy in the love that God has for you. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. We praise and thank you for the blessings of this day, O God, and this time to worship together. As we hear your ancient word that has transcended generations and blessed the lives of those who have believed, bring your word to us anew this day. Open our hearts to receive and our minds to understand the familiar yet powerful message about the Good Samaritan. And then, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, guide us to receive your mercy and to care for others as we bring your presence into our world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The message of, God, of the gospel is grounded in the events of the resurrection. For the Apostle Paul, the resurrection does away with any efforts on our own earnings of God's favor. It is through Christ the sin that sin was overcome, and all the benefits of Christ's resurrection will be ours as well. Since that is our hope, that is also the guide for how to live. Live in response to what God has done for us. A reading from Romans, the sixth chapter, verses 1b through 11. Shall we go on sinning that, so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were, who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We who were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in death, his death, we certainly, we will certainly also be united with him for his in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of our sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Brothers and sisters, the Holy Gospel according to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he replied, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, dearest brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I think all of us can agree that there is a certain comfort that comes with what is familiar. Familiar, familiarity leads us to eat at the same restaurants, we drive the usual routes, we have our familiar friends, they know us and we know them. We have our familiar clothes, which we would say are our lifestyle. We listen to a familiar music on Pandora or our favorite radio station. And uh, we like our same routine and that's what's familiar. And then with familiarity, there's that certain element of those emotions of peace, uh, joy, and comfort in what is familiar. Well, then there are times when the familiar has changed. It could be an unsettling health diagnosis, a divorce, a job loss, um, an issue uh, with the kids at school. And um, all of a sudden, the challenge is how to respond when what is familiar is no longer present. And the questions are, how do I respond? Um, how are other people responding? How do, when will what is familiar be present again? And with that dynamic, those emotions when there's change, there's surprise, there's anger, frustration, and even a sense of worry about moving forward. And it's interesting that anytime we approach God's word, there's a sense of familiarity we bring to it. And there's also a sense of change as well, because every time we hear the gospel or a section of scripture in worship, our lives have changed since the last time we heard that familiar story change within the past month, within the past year, within the past week. And today we're focusing on a familiar story. I know all of, many of you know it. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a story that we've learned in Sunday school, confirmation. We've learned it in worship over the years. I mean, there's even a law that is named after this story in Scripture. And the reason I chose this story this morning to preach on is not only one of my favorites, but I believe that amidst the many changes in our lives, especially since March, a familiar story is good, and it can be a blessing to our lives and inspire us in how we live out our faith in Jesus Christ each day. So I'm going to just walk you through this brief story, The Good Samaritan, but I want you, I need you to have your, your imagination cap on. You know you're in school, you have your thinking cap, Well, also you have your imagination. I want you to use your imagination as I walk you through this unique story this morning. All right, here we go. The story, um, the context for the story of the Good Samaritan is actually a game. Well, it's not actually a game game like we think of a game, but it's kind of like a game in that the religious leaders were always trying to ask Jesus questions, uh, asking him various questions in, in an attempt to discredit his knowledge and discredit his teaching. And the reason they wanted to ask Jesus all these questions is that Jesus had a lot of followers. And in ancient times, if you had followers, if you had a crowd, you had influence. So they're trying to discredit Jesus, in essence, to let other people hopefully 
watch Jesus, hear Jesus say a wrong answer, and then step away from him and go back to the old religious norms. Because religious leaders wanted the crowd. They wanted power and control. They didn't want Jesus to be in such a state of power and control. So the game and the context for the story of the Good Samaritan is a game that I made up. It's called Stump the Rabbi. Because Rabbi in this time is a religious leader. Jesus is a religious leader and a teacher. So the game begins with these words from Matthew. Now, one of the disciples. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? All right, so the game has begun. The first question has been asked. The studio audience is watching. Well, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? Well, he answered, Michael, an element of confidence in his presence. Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. And, now this was, he was paying attention when Jesus taught this, love your neighbor as yourself. The studio audience nods in agreement. Some are smiling in their approval for this correct answer. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted, Matthew writes, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? All right, well, Pastor Andy Stanley, uh, lead, lead pastor, founding pastor, North Point Community Church in Atlanta, uh, wrote about his take on what this leader is saying to Jesus. And his words are this. If loving my neighbor is proof of my love for God, which the leader says, the leader's thinking, if loving my neighbor is proof of my love for God, which is the key to eternal life, tell me exactly whom I'm expected to love so I can secure me some eternal life. What's the minimum requirement? What's the minimum amount of neighbor loving I'm required to perform to ensure eternal life for myself. So if this religious leader, if he could just trick Jesus to equate Jews with non-Jews, the crowd would certainly turn on Jesus because it was a holy code for Jews to be separate as God's chosen people and away from non-Jews. Because God's, because if you could answer Jesus, Jesus, if you could mistake, give me a mistake in your answer, if he could make a mistake, this religious leader would go down as the first religious leader to win in the game of Stump the Rabbi. And Jesus sees through all of this. And he was months away. Now think about this. He was months away from establishing God's new covenant with the world with the, his, death on a his death on the cross and his resurrection. And yet if the gospel, if the gospel is to spread beyond that little area in the world, beyond Judea and beyond Galilee, his followers, would his followers would have to abandon one key detail, their ancient racist ways. So then Pastor Stanley then writes the following. So then Jesus launched into his most disorienting, paradigm-shifting, mind-bending parable of all. We've reduced this parable to a figure of speech. In its original context, it was so much more. All right, so now back to the game of Stump the Rabbi. And Jesus begins his teaching. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And, and we know what happens after that. Two religious leaders see that man on the road. They gently see him. They walk across the street to the other side and just leave him there for dead. So if Jesus' formula was correct, those two religious leaders were dead. Were, were doomed, rather. They didn't love their Jewish neighbor. Therefore, they didn't love God. They could offer their sacrifices at the temple all day long. But if Jesus was correct, no one in heaven would be listening to him. So imagine the crowd here, or we could say the studio audience, they're watching this game of Stump the Rabbi unfold. And now they're leaning in. And they're silent in anticipation of what's going to happen next. And Jesus looks over the crowd, and I think he had a glean in his eye. He had them right where he wanted them. So he wrinkles his brow a little bit, showing that he's also concerned with what he's about to say. And he breaks the silence with these words. 
but a Samaritan. And then in that moment, there are murmurings in the studio audience. Both Jesus and the religious leader look away from each other and they look out over the crowd because the crowd's getting kind of unsettled. And Jesus continues, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And, a, and in that moment, a guy from the crowd yells, Surely you're not going to make the Samaritan a hero. And another woman next to him says, yeah, you can't do that. And in a sense of anger and surprise, the crowd's tone has shifted a little bit. Because of what Jesus was saying was ridiculous. Few, if anybody in that audience, would do such a thing for a Samaritan. No Samaritan that they'd met would do such a thing for a Jew. And these groups didn't speak to each other. They were never with each other. Because Jews were better than Samaritans. It's always been that way. That's what was familiar. But not only does Jesus make the Samaritan the hero, he made him the extra mile. You have got to be kidding me. Who would do that kind of hero? And the Samaritan didn't just pity the man. Jesus continues. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. But this, this wasn't surprising enough. Jesus isn't finished. He takes a deep breath and then continues. The next day, seriously, Jesus. The crowd's getting even more upset. Do you really expect to us to believe that a Samaritan would care for a Jew for the entire night? Are you kidding me? Jesus goes on. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. This was so over the top. Because in that moment, in this moment, Jesus took what was familiar and introduced a change that would define his life and his ministry. Jesus redefined neighbor for everybody, forever, and it was over the top. Jesus took the familiar societal minimum standard in trying to be right with God and changed it to being over the top. Over the top in compassion. Over the top in unity. Over the top in forgiveness. Over the top in acceptance. Over the top in serving others. Over the top in gently speaking the truth for others to have a better life. Because in only a few short months after this story, Jesus would demonstrate God's love for you and for the entire world in a fashion that no one expected. It broke what was familiar. It was so over the top with his death on a cross and his resurrection for your sin, for my sin, for the world's sin, that we may have salvation and redemption and a new relationship with God our Father in heaven through Jesus Christ. And for us today, this story, the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, poses these questions. First of all, first one, as a follower of Christ, would you prefer the minimum and what's familiar, or do you want to be over the top? As a member of apostles, would you prefer the minimum of what's asked of you, or be over the top. And finally, as, as a congregation, would you prefer the minimum of what is asked of you of God, by God or be over the top? And what I have experienced here at Apostles these past four years is the many ways that you, as a congregation, you as a member of this church, that we have been over the top in our mission and ministry. And I want to share some of the over the top details. And I'm not bragging here. But I think we all need to be reminded of the over-the-top things you guys have been doing, we have been doing. The Congregation Assessment Tool, the CAT survey, led our council to set some goals, and then eventually gave birth to our capital campaign, Forward in Faith. The campaign led to funds that replaced the roofs on our campus, new AC units, uh, pre-painting the worship center, new sound system, a new, pro new updated projectors, a new projector in the back, our synod benevolence, we met our Synod Benevolence goal of 10% of our entire budget. 
We demolished the old rental home across the street. Rebecca Circle, our quilting group, donated over 900 quilts last year throughout the Tampa area, Brandon area, and through other um, ELCA outreach efforts around the world. Our Christmas in July program blessed schools in our area. We continue to feed the homeless at the end of every month. Our first ever Christmas sharing project last year provided school Christmas gifts for our kids in our preschool and resources for our preschool teachers. You funded 11 kids going to the National Youth Gathering and each kid only had to pay, and their family only had to pay $100. But you wanted to make sure the youth went to the National Youth Gathering and you paid for nearly all of their expenses. And all of these over-the-top acts of ministry took us out of what was familiar and brought change. And yes, at times, those elements of change were unsettling and they were challenging, but we did it because of God's glory and that God has blessed us in many ways. All right, so back to Stump the Rabbi. So then Jesus asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. And you notice this? He doesn't even refer to the man as a Samaritan. He says, the one. The one who had mercy on him. And in this moment, I think Jesus smiled at the lawyer. And he looked over the crowd and smiled. And he said, go and do likewise. End of the game. Jesus wins again. Because in sharing the love of Christ and caring for our neighbor, it's not qualified based on gender, on race, on sexual orientation, on past, on political beliefs, or on religious beliefs. You just share God's love with the neighbor because that's what Christ expects of you as one of his followers. So here on my final Sunday, and I, pr I pray that the mission of our church, that being go into the world to be and make disciples for Christ, continues to bring God's presence into your life and into the lives of many and into the lives of many around the world. Because this miss, our mission statement has been inspired and is connected to the story of the Good Samaritan to not settle for the minimum, but to be over the top in living out our faith. And it has been an honor and a privilege to be with you as your pastor these past four years, to witness God's word inspire and empower all of us with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Together we have established blessings and we haven't settled for the minimum, but with patience and following God and the Holy Spirit, we have generally reached over the top and our congregation has prospered and flourished. And now I pray that you enjoy the good things that are familiar here at Apostles, and we will eventually come back into the building once it is safe. But I also hope you embrace the change that God has for us. Like you've done in the past four years, embrace the change with open arms as God leads you forward. And Reverend Steve Kaufman is an exceptional pastor, and he and I have talked extensively about this transition. And I trust that you will welcome him and support him in his leadership as your interim pastor as you have welcomed and supported me as well. And Mary Ann DeLeo, our exceptional council president, is also a good friend of me and my family. And I trust you will hold her in her exceptional leadership and that of our church council as they lead our congregation forward as well. Because may you never settle for the minimum, friends, but be over the top in living as disciples of Jesus Christ. And together as a congregation, Continue to live as neighbors to all people on earth for the sake of Jesus Christ and the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us now join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hello, people of God. My name is Connie Schmucker, and I'm the assistant to the Bishop for Leadership in the Florida Bahamas Synod. I so wish that I could be with you on this day, but nevertheless, I bring you greetings on behalf of Bishop Pedro Suarez. We are so very grateful for you and the ministry that you have shared with your community and beyond. And Pastor Jim, we are especially grateful for you on this day. For you, Michelle, Benjamin, Abigail, and Catherine. For not only the ministry and life that you have shared with this congregation, Apostles Lutheran Church, but with the Florida Bahamas Synod and the entire ELCA. I also want to take a moment to remind all of you that Pastor Jim is not leaving Apostles Lutheran Church but that he is following God's call, faithfully following God's call, just as you, the people of apostles, are also following God's call. May God richly bless all of you until we meet again. Amen. Pastor Jim, on January 10th, 2016, we of Apostles Lutheran Church called you to be the pastor in this place, to proclaim God's word, to baptize and teach, to announce God's forgiveness, and to preside at the Lord's table. With the gospel, you have comforted us in times of sickness and trouble and at the death of our loved ones. Sharing our joys and sorrows, you and your family have been important to our life together in the Church of Jesus Christ in our service to this community and in God's mission to the whole world. As you leave this community of faith, we say farewell and we pray for God's blessing. People of God, members of Apostles Lutheran Church, do you release Reverend Jim Page from service as your pastor? We do, and we give thanks to God for our ministry together. Pastor Jim, do you recognize and accept the completion of your ministry with Apostles Lutheran Church? I do, and I give thanks to God for our ministry together. In keeping with our synodical practice in deacon ministry, the deacons of our church will now place their stoles on the altar. Deacons work in partnership with the pastor in ministry at the pastor's discretion. When a pastor leaves a call, the deacons are also in transition and await the arrival of our new pastor. Our deacons include Liz Jimenez, Bert Seiber, Judy Valeri, John Hansen, and Joel Rents. Ron Bicicker and Coleman Hill, also deacons, were not able to join us today. Let us pray. Almighty God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you gave the holy apostles many gifts and commanded them to feed your flock. You equip your people with abilities that differ according to the grace given to them, and you call them to various avenues of service. 
we give you thanks for the ministry of Apostles Lutheran Church among the people of God in this place. You watch over our going out and our coming in. Bless this time of ending and beginning. You surround your people in every time and place. Keep us close in your love. You accompany your people in times of joy and times of trial. Prosper all that has been done to your glory in this time together. Heal and forgive all that has fallen short of your will for us. Help Pastor Jim, his family, and all of us to live with courage and gladness in the future you give to us. As they have been a blessing to us, so now send them forth to be a blessing to others. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Whoa!